Kim, thank you very much for joining me on the show, man. It's uh, it's awesome to be able to connect with with you guys over in Australia. Thanks for doing this, dude. Well, thanks for having me on. No, it's uh, it, it's wicked. I uh, you're, you're obviously a, a very very strong strong dude. You got some wicked wicked numbers, and I'm very excited to 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 talk to you. Obviously, you were meant to compete recently with everything that's gone on. That's been moved back. That's been pushed back. Um, but still, still working hard. Still trying to hit those big numbers. So, in terms of getting involved with with powerlifting and where this kind of really originated and started from you, what was kind of like the origin story of you first getting into the gym, and how did you come across uh, this whole kind of incredible competition of strength sports? Um, this is coming from when I was younger. So obviously a lot of the stories is like, oh, you're fat when you're younger. Cause I was a bit bullied with, by my parents and my brother. So a bit overweight, um, they'd always make comment that, and that, what, uh, that got me into the gym in the first place. Okay. So I was like, how do I lose weight? Um, how do I stop feeling like this? And it was probably at 14 where I started going to the gym started training going on the just go on the internet i don't know whether you went on like to bodybuilding.com or stuff yeah dude, uh, i lived on like that for years dude uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you used to be on the forums reading everything and um yeah my form wasn't the greatest but that's where i got started and then it wasn't until i was 18. so in my last year of high school where i joined an actual gym and one of the PTs over there, he was like, hey, you're kind of strong. Why don't you compete in powerlifting? And I was like, what What the hell is that? <laughs> I had no idea what powerlifting was. But he introduced me to it. He said, oh, there's a show coming up here. Do you want to do it? And I said, sure, why not? And that's where it started. So you, you, when you first got into the gym, you were doing uh, like bodybuilding style work, though, right? Like you, you were, you were very, very big yeah. on the physique stuff. You, you got to a relatively high level with with your bodybuilding and, and conditioning stuff there, right? Um, no. So I have done bodybuilding. I did. That was two thousand sixteen. I did three men's physique shows. Yeah. Um. And honestly, I didn't have any training with bodybuilding then. Um, okay. I went straight from powerlifting to dieting and uh, competing in men's physique. So prior to that, it was all just strength training. Sweet. That, that, that's very, very interesting because I feel like a lot of people come at it from the other way. So, so many people have that foundation in bodybuilding and go, oh, you know, actually, fuck this. I can't, I can't do all this dieting stuff all the time. Like, it's driving me crazy. Like, I just want to eat whatever I want and just get jacked and big. So, that's really interesting that you've actually, like, flipped that natural progression. So, that's wicked, though. So, how did you find uh, kind of... Because obviously when you're dieting, dude, it's just, it's the hardest thing ever because you're not necessarily going to be able to keep up those numbers. As someone that spent as long as you probably did transfixed on like your squat bench dead, obviously your big, big bench. How how the hell did you get around that kind of psychologically? Because that's got to play havoc with you internally, like dieting down and just watching all of your numbers just fizzle away. Um, yes and no. Initially... I accepted the fact that I was going to get weaker. And when I put my mind to it, I kind of just run with it. It doesn't really matter any uh, about anything else. So if I went into bodybuilding, numbers was not my concern. All I cared about was getting lean uh, and building a bit of muscle and just competing. So I guess with all, it's like a job. You just have to do it. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. It's, it's awesome that you think about it like that. I think for, for a lot of people, they, they don't have that mentality of just kind of like switch off, suck it up, eat the meals or not eat the meals, do the cardio and just, just get it done. So I think that kind of speaks testament to, uh, you know, your training and your training mentality because I think that's something that you kind of, you have to develop quite a thick skin, especially when it comes down to strength sports because it's so black and white. You know, if you don't hit your lift in training that day, it's not on anyone else. It's on you. Everything that you do is on you and it falls upon you. So it's that whole thing of like, okay, like I, I've got to own this because I'm the only one in control here. So that that that's, that speaks testament to obviously like what you're trying to do with, with all of your strength training. So in terms of uh, 
going from powerlifting into bodybuilding and then coming back into strength sports how how did that process kind of work for you because that's that's very like higgledy piggledy all over the place bro <laughs> oh man um i so when i was competing before bodybuilding i was in the ni under 90 kilo class and i was living i was lifting uh whatever the numbers i was lifting i did bodybuilding i went down in strength and i actually rebounded up to 100 kilos so that's the next class over and my lifts didn't get any better <laughs> it literally went down. so my first competition back i think i actually did a bit worse than what i did at 90 kilos so that was a tough pill to swallow yeah yeah that that's got to be hard especially kind of knowing what you've done previously and then not hitting that so how well it's interesting so obviously you rebound up to 100 kilos you're then obviously presented with okay i can either sit in this 100 kilo weight class and sort my lifting out or i can start just trying to trim back a little bit head back down towards that 90 kilo class and maybe get a little bit of respect a little bit quicker do you know what i mean so how did that process work honestly after uh, uh after dieting for so long yeah. I did not want to go back to the nineties. <laughs> so it was just like, okay, I either enjoy my food right here or I can die even more. And I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. Honestly, I hated it. It just, it just burns you out. Doesn't it? Like, I think it kind of gives you like that. It's the kind of negative association of just like feeling hungry, feeling tired, feeling lethargic. You're like, nah, nah, I want to feel pepped up. I want to feel ready to go. I'll feel like I want to just kill some weights. So I think psychologically, it's really, really, really hard. So like hats off to anyone out there that's powerlifting that's doing like immense body weight drops prior to competitions because I just feel like that just must fuck you so hard. It, it like... The most I've dropped, I think, was eight kilos in a day. And that was that was gruesome. But doing bodybuilding made me appreciate or uh, appreciate how hard it actually is to diet down to those kind of levels of body fat. Before it was like, oh, okay, you're dieting, you're doing this, you just drop body fat. That's easy. But then once you come into competition for bodybuilding, the last four weeks, I could not string a sentence together on the last week of my prep. I just couldn't. It was just, my brain was just mush. Yeah, and that's, that's not what you want at all. Kind of coming into any training environment, I think like I've been around people that compete and I know what it's like. And it's it's kind of weird and scary to kind of watch these people over like 12, 16 weeks just slowly kind of fizzle and dwindle away to nothingness and just kind of, watch them have like it's almost like the like newborn baby brain like you just can't get anything together just like constantly <laughs> dazed doesn't doesn't really know what's going on no spatial awareness you're like oh man how is this good for you <laughs> so in terms i know of... so when it was time no so crack, crack yeah. on oh now you go no so i was just gonna say so was... when it was time to pick between <laughs> No, you go, you go. All right, no, you go, you go. You go, you go. No, I'm going to be polite now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's awkward when there's a delay on the Skype. Yeah. So when it was time to pick between powerlifting and bodybuilding, it's either like you want to diet or do you want to eat and feel good every session? Yeah, and I think that... That's all it came down to. A big difference with your powerlifting because, of course, with every single session, when you're trying to hit those big numbers and you're trying to make sure that you're making progress week in and week out, you're keeping everything tight. You don't want any kind of external extrinsic factors to be messing with that whatsoever. So whether that's like your environment, but like even bigger, so I think kind of internally psychologically, and I think that's the one big kind of takeaway from all of that bodybuilding stuff is just even though it's a physical thing, how much mental tax it puts on you, like having to diet, having to deal with all of that, having that fatigue, 
I just think, you know, unless you are someone that has been doing this for a number of years and you're cutting and cycling for shows, I think it's it's almost impossible to, to get the best out of both worlds in terms of getting strong and getting lean. I just, it's, they're just two completely separate polar at, at opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Like powerlifting all the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to be involved in anything that's going to uh, going to restrict anything that you want to put in your mouth. So, in terms of kind of working with your powerlifting, then how <laughs> how much are you kind of just very gently overviewing like your general weight maintenance throughout seasons and stuff? Obviously, if you're going into weight categories, you have to be a little bit more kind of conscious of these things because you don't want to be rocking up two weeks away and like you say like having to be like oh i'm nine keys over here like i thought i was on the mark and now i'm gonna have to sweat out on a sauna for the next like 16 hours to drop some of this weight um honestly i look at my weight every day i also track all my every day I've been doing it for the last nine years since I was 16. So back then you didn't really have like my fitness power or anything like that. I wrote everything on a piece of paper every at the end of every day and figured out how much food I had left. Like that's how, that's how uh, obsessed I was with all this. But I love that because I think obsession kind of, it speaks for itself. I think if you look at anyone that's successful, especially like some of the incredible athletes I've had the opportunity to speak to, every single one of them has that obsessive trait. You know, they were the guys that were there that were figuring out, you know, those those little percentiles here and there, or, you know, how can we make training better with this or with that or whatever, you know, when you're as proactive as that, I think it just, it speaks forth in your results, doesn't it? If you're going to be uh, as obsessed and as kind of involved with this industry, then then it all speaks for itself. So in terms of kind of, you know, keep keeping your body conditioned throughout the season, are you, are you bringing anything else outside of diet involved? Like obviously in the powerlifting world, cardio is just a fucking no-no. Um, are you doing anything to kind of keep calorie expenditure throughout the day up? Are you just working on nutrition? Because I spoke to Stan Efferding and he's kind of saying, you know, it doesn't really make sense to be kind of trading out calories for energy, like just eat a little bit less and you don't have to worry about moving as much. So how are you attacking it? Um, I do at least 10,000 steps a day. I like to keep very active just because... I have a bit of an opposite, um, I guess, thought on it. I want to move a lot and I also want to eat a lot. Um, not only that is I also take care of my sleeping. Um, I do meditation. I have my own psychologist that I go uh, to keep my mental health in check as well. So everything that I can um, do to help my powerlifting and just me as a person, I will. That's really interesting that you've brought that up. So in terms of uh, like the psychological side of things, is 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 that kind of uh, you taking factors that you would have previously taken in the gym to kind of use it as a coping mechanism and, and getting rid of it that way? Is it with you kind of dealing and coping with the, the stressing factors of competition? Or is this just literally for your own peace of mind just to get everything out of your head so when you then go into these training environments you're feeling as good as you can um probably the last one but it isn't just for powerlifting so obviously us as pts um we like to overwork because we have that flexibility of just putting clients after clients after clients and a lot of pts do burn out so this is my way to keep uh, my career in check, my powerlifting in check, and just me as a person as a whole, um, and trying to reduce as much stress as possible. Because if you stress a lot, you, you're going to be in a world of pain with your body as well. So it all connects. It isn't just your body. You have to get your mind right. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It's 100% a whole holistic thing. It's a, it's like a lifestyle. It's a, it's a body. It's a mentality. And you know what? I completely agree with you. And I'm so glad that you've said that. You're like the, like one of the few people that have kind of brought this up 
that stress is such a big factor when coming into any of this stuff. And people don't even think about things, just like little things that stress you out. You don't even think about that you just kind of bottle up, you put it in the back of your mind, and that just kind of like festers away in there for the next two or three weeks. And as a PT, I mean, I worked as a PT for, for several years now, and I don't know what it's like for a lot of people. Personal training is, yeah, it's them getting fit, it's them exercising. For a lot of people, it's also like a therapy and, and a way to kind of get out those stresses and dumps as well. So for a personal trainer, you have to be very wary because you end up taking on board a lot of other people's baggage. And if you don't know how to deal with baggage, if you don't know, how, like people will just open up and say, like I've had clients open up and say stuff that even their husband doesn't know. And I'm like, okay, I really don't think I'm the person you should be telling this shit to, <laughs> but it's fine. But then having you then having someone to be like, okay, here's all of this stuff. Now I don't have to worry about it. And I can actually focus on my <laughs> shit again rather than take all of your clients' problems home. That's ingenious, man. I love that thought process. That makes so much sense. I, I think the mental aspect is something that a lot of people will neglect. Um, whether that they just don't know, but, but there, is a, uh, there is a bit of a taboo it comes to seeing a psychologist so yeah. it's like um yeah like i don't have a problem well you don't need to have a problem to see a psychologist you don't need to have a problem to get your mind right this is all to better yourself but also doing it preemptively you're gonna make sure that you're in a position that you don't ever need that you're not like oh man like i'm, I'm stuck at, at ends here like i have no other option i'm gonna have to go and do this it's like no, nah, man, I've been doing this the whole time. I'm just, I'm keeping on top of it. And I think that that's very interesting, you know, for, for someone that doesn't even need to do it, that's proactively going out and doing it, you can obviously see for yourself and your programming and your clients and your progression that that works for you. So you're just doing it. You're not even thinking about it as like, okay, I'm having to go out of my way to go and do this. It's just a part of your, your lifestyle. So in terms of going back, you said you also do like meditation and stuff as well. Yep. Yeah. So um, practice your breathing. Uh, mindfulness is a big thing that I do. So just being more aware of like your presence. Because if you ask anyone, how do you feel right now? Or what do you feel right now? Or what do you feel when you're working? They'll, they, they don't have an answer because they don't even think about it. So when you actually take the time and think about it and be more aware about your space, um, you're just going to have a clearer mind. Yeah, so are you doing uh, just kind of just focusing on breathing exercises? Is this kind of like Wim Hof style stuff? Are you doing kind of like flow meditative yoga? Uh, are you kind of just working through like uh, mantras, humming? What are you doing? So that's ju it's just uh, practicing mindfulness. So with my psych, he's, give, uh, he's given me a lot of exercises to do, um, even recordings to listen to and uh, go along with that as well. Um, and then exercises to do. So something with mindfulness is the next time you're having breakfast, why don't you eat slower and think about everything that's going on right now, like how your hand feel against the spoon or how do you even feel when the food touches your mouth? I know before with me, like if I go rush to work, it's just spoon, 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 and then out the door. And you don't take a second to even slow down. Yeah, and I think that's so funny because for for people that are in this industry, they will know that like eating is like 80% of the game. Like if you, if you want to get your gains and you want to stay on board, you want to stay on track, you got to eat. And for, <laughs> for a lot of people in this industry, they're eating a hell of a lot. So that whole kind of idea of taking something that's so freaking monotonous every single day, like you're eating like five, six, seven meals a day and turning it into something, just just flipping on its head, making it positive, making you think about it a little bit more. I, I love that as a concept because it's, you know, you're going to be there anyways. Why not put your phone down? Instagram's going to be there in 15 minutes, bro. Don't worry about it. <laughs> like just take a little bit of time for yourself and actually enjoy it. I, I think that's that's, that's very, very interesting because so many people just glance over this. So what do you feel like that kind of, that mindfulness, maybe just that everyday gratitude has done for you? 
it's made me a lot more calmer and with me i used to like i'm so used to living in an anxious routine just like wake up brush your teeth eat go straight to work 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 train uh go back home maybe do a bit more work go to sleep and st actually stopping has made me a lot more calmer and it's just so many uh, benefits from being a lot calmer as well um, you sleep better one of the biggest things is sleep is like okay you get eight hours sleep but how many of that was good sleep like how long did it take to get for you to get to sleep um, and not just you want to get into a deep sleep for you to recover rather than just sleeping lightly yeah it's making sure that all of those different recovery factors are being optimized isn't it i think sleep is obviously such a huge one that people i don't think like you said respect that whole kind of yeah okay i'm going to bed and it's eight hours till i get up but how long has it taken you to fall asleep how long are you sat on your phone how much blue light have you got around you that's kind of blocking out serotonin like there's there's so many of these little things and the deeper we kind of we go down the rabbit hole the deeper we realize that the rabbit hole kind of keeps on going and it, it is it's a bit overwhelming at times so did you notice like a big difference like just with sleep and stuff like straight off the bat did you kind of notice that you kind of felt like you had that weight lifted off of your shoulders that you weren't just kind of I don't know, like just fucking angry every day at just random stuff that you didn't need to be or super anxious or whatever it was for you? So it's a bit of a yes and no question since if you get into mindfulness and it, it's not about stopping. It's not about stopping the anxiety. It's about just uh, sitting in it and knowing that you're anxious and that kind of helps you. So whenever you try, imagine you're trying to sleep and you want to stop your thoughts what happens like you don't you don't stop your thoughts you think even more and you <laughs> don't even go to sleep yeah exactly you go crazy but next time you go to sleep um and you actually realize that okay what's what's annoying me or what's making me anxious or even just knowing that you're anxious kind of you eventually drift off so it's like it takes time for you to go from um, okay I'm anxious and practicing over and over and over again until you get to a point where you're like okay I can I can calm myself down now so it isn't easy at the start no no not at all I think from I mean I I've, I've suffered with a little bit of anxiety I've worked with a lot of clients that have, that have struggled very very badly and I think it's very much one of those things that the more you do it, the faster you can kind of kind of dampen out those thoughts and that anxiety and that feeling. And at the start, it is very much like you said, it's almost like a it's almost like a, a, a mental battle that kind of like you fighting against your internal self, kind of reaffirming that everything's going to be OK yeah. and that you don't have to worry. And then I think, you know, over time, as you kind of figure out what makes you tick. I think that's the thing, you know, everybody works so completely individually that it's so hard to say, okay, we know if you try this, that this is going to work, but kind of going, okay, well, yeah, it's, it's going to suck a little bit at the beginning, but this is just something that I've got to keep up with because I can't do anything about it really. So I'm just going to have to make the best out of the worst situation. Yeah, it's just like anything. Um, if you want to get good at lifting, you keep on practicing and you'll probably suck in the beginning. I I sucked so much in the beginning. I was I was complete trash. I used to do my quarter squats. I used to do my um, completely rounded back deadlifts. Like, I sucked. But with anything, the more you practice, the better you get. And even if you get to a point where you're kind of good at it, you'll still kind of suck on some days. Yeah, and, and that's what people need to realize. Yeah, it, it's not going to go 100% all the time. So I, I'm really, really interested to hop off on, on that because obviously we have to deal with failures. We have to deal with sessions that don't go 100%. Are you doing anything proactively like when you feel like you're having those sessions or maybe you don't hit that lift on the platform? Are you then going back in here and kind of going over anything again? Are you reaffirming things? Are you having to switch your mindset up? Because obviously when you have those those days or those sessions or those comps, 
you kind of have to change things up and you kind of have to ch change the pace psychologically, how you're thinking about things to kind of maybe get the best out of yourself or kind of get yourself out of that shit mindset. Yeah, so when like whenever you're lifting, it's just you have to take the emotion out of it. Um, if you're having a bad session, then you have to auto regulate that, and you have to, you just have to drop to a point where you're not you're not feeling or you're feeling good. Drop to a weight where you're feeling good. If you're meant to squat 300 and 220, only 220 feels good. Drop to 220. Take the emotion out. Don't hit 300, um, but don't get too caught up up about numbers there's always another session you better off doing less right now than doing more and injuring yourself so uh, like uh, my point is take the emotion out and think about it logically and what's the next step yeah that's beautiful i think so many people get caught up with that emotional aspect of things and you, you know it's almost like they end up becoming angry at themselves for not hitting that weight and you're like okay dude do you really think that you like getting angry and more emotional more pent up is then going to allow you to control an extra 20 40 60 kilos in your back and your better you're like no bro you're going crazy here like there's no way hell this is going to help and i think that's uh that's a brilliant point to make is that if you could just take out that emotion that actually you know i think that in and of itself is kind of half of the stress you know that your body doesn't know what fucking weight is on the bar your body has no idea where it's 220 222.5 225 it's like your body just knows that this is heavy so don't put that extra stress of being like okay we've got to hit these numbers today bro it's like no your, your body just knows okay this is hard or yeah we can deal with this <laughs> yeah i think that's what's uh at the high level um people will argue auto regulate their sessions a lot more and people that just probably start off are more more concerned about numbers yeah most definitely so for, for yourself kind of coming into your your training your training cycles how much are you auto regulating so obviously with with powerlifting squat bench and dead you you have kind of you you know what you need to do you've got your your lifts that you that you need to complete as kind of someone who obviously has a, a a freaking ridiculous bench you're a bench specialist how do you then go in and break up your your training so you're saying okay how much of my conscious time i could am i contributing to you know my deadlift my squat my bench and how much am i contributing it kind of percentile wise to you know what is my strongest lift what is my weakest lift are you focusing on more than others to overcompensate? Are you fo are you doubling down on your strengths? How do you like to, to work on it? Honestly, um, uh, I focus a lot on my bench, uh, just because I'm good at it, and I uh, I hate squats. I absolutely hate squats. Deadlifts, same thing. I don't like doing them. <laughs> Even though my best deadlift um, is 320 for two, I hate it. Uh, my best squat in wraps is 330. I still hate it. It's heavy. It's hard. But when I get under a bench, it feels nice. Yeah. It's yeah. It's it's a different different ball game. Yeah, I'm, and I'm gonna be honest. Uh, even though I do treat this obsessively and like my job. When it comes down to squats, sometimes I'll miss some of my accessories, which we shouldn't really be doing. But it's just, I don't like it that much. <laughs> I just don't like it. But it, it's it's interesting because I, you know, I've spoken to to several people now, and it's kind of the the whole thing of, okay, well, you know, you obviously you're still fucking strong with your bench, you're still strong with your deadlift, and you're still strong with your squat, regardless of whether you like the latter two. But, you know, if you enjoy your bench and you want to become a big bencher, I think it's really important to kind of put it out there and, and, and tell the world, you know, it does. it's not a bad thing. Like, if you want to double down and you want to be a specialist and you want to have the biggest bench, you know, in, in Australia, in the world, in your weight category, all-time world record, that doesn't matter. Like, I think a lot of people, I think there are a lot of people out there that need to also stop trying to be the jack of all trades. And I think you probably see that in powerlifting so freaking much you know someone that has a lift that is just 
overwhelmingly better than every single one of their other lifts. And all they're doing is they're just trying to kind of keep everything else a little bit more respectable. So their title doesn't seem like dog shit. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's really interesting, you know. For, for you, do you think that this is ever a thing where you would potentially say, okay, you know, maybe I only want to enter into just bench competitions. What is your thought process moving forward? Um, I think that uh, I don't really like single lift too much, <laughs> even though, I, yeah, um, I don't really like single lifts too much because even though I don't like squatting, uh, training the squat and training the deadlift, I do enjoy doing them. I have done a bench only comp. Uh, I think it was pro raw two years ago. I just did bench only and I just, I didn't feel fulfilled after the competition. After you do three lifts, you feel tired, but it was like, man, that was such a great day. I had so much energy left after bench only. I was like, I don't really enjoy this. <laughs> I'd rather be squatting and deadlifting. Yeah, and kind of coming away actually feeling like you, you know, you've 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 given everything on the day. So that's that's brilliant though. So coming back to it then, as someone who has a strong ass bench. And as much as your deadlift and your squat is respectable, how how are you dealing with that on the day? Obviously, like going into your bench, you must be like a fucking kid in a candy shop because this is exactly what you're here for. But then how <laughs> how do you then kind of psych yourself up and get yourself in that kind of mindset of like, right, I've got to get this deadlift done. I've got to get this squat done. Otherwise, I'm not getting anywhere close to a decent total today. Well, for my squat, that's pretty easy. Um, in my ba in the back of my head, I don't want to bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been close to bombing my squats before. Um, yeah, I've been close. Last pro raw, um, I missed the I missed the star command of the squat, and got red lights. And for the second attempt, I I just completely screwed up screwed it up. So I only had one more attempt until the squat. So that was enough motivation for me to be like, okay, I really need to do this. And with the deadlift, honestly, it is hard for me to get motivated um, just because I'm very up and down with my deadlift. Uh, one, one week, I'll probably hit 260. And the other week, I'll hit 320. And this is all from sumo, right? It, yeah. Yeah. So my sumo has always been a lot more comfortable than my uh, conventional. And even though it's cheating, I like the lift. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that, that's, that's something that's so kind of hotly thrown about in the, in the powerlifting world of just people shitting on sumo pullers. I think, I think that's just like, that's the, that's the rugby banter I grew up with, but like on a, on a worldwide level, I absolutely love that. Well, obviously it doesn't take anything away from it. There's, there's still big, big numbers, but obviously like I've seen now in, obviously we're in quarantine, we're coping with whatever we, we kind of can, that you've now kind of, you've taken it back a little bit i'm going okay like i'm gonna work on my conventional a little bit i'm gonna work on my high bars i'm gonna work on all this stuff, stuff that i know that i kind of that i'm not as strong as so how are you finding that and and how how do you do you ever kind of change it up so in terms of like are you just pulling sumo the whole time regardless are you changing up so you're getting any different hip stimulus in there or are you kind of doing that with accessory work like how are you playing that um so sumo has taken a bit of a back seat right now and obviously my conventional has uh been a priority just because before when i did both lifts they both uh sumo felt a lot better when my conventional was stronger but last year I neglected my conventional a lot and I really felt it with my sumo. Uh, so right now the plan for me is to do a lot of conventional and keep sumo at a very light volume, but still have it there just to practice the technique. I love that. So just keeping the movement pattern fresh, not letting the body stagnate with how it needs to be or your kind of set positions. And then how heavy are you then gonna kind of try and take up that conventional? What numbers were you working for? 
before and what are you kind of aiming to, to kind of get out there now? Um, right now, I think within 12 weeks, I'd like to hit a 300 conventional. So I've never hit that before. Um, the best I've done was 290 for two, and I actually failed 300 the week after. Um, honestly, my long, I have long legs, and it just makes getting into position for a sumo, uh, not a sumo, a conventional, so much more annoying, and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, and I think that's a big thing to, to kind of bring up as well, is that kind of you have to find the stance positioning style whatever it is that works for you so obviously i think that brings us on perfectly to the competition bench press because that is something that from the outside just looks like the craziest wackiest gnarliest shit <laughs> ever to anyone that doesn't understand what you're trying to do um so talk to me competition bench press how did you kind of first wet your whistle obviously no one like just straight away hops underneath the bench and kind of looks like a, a, a an N shape when they're benching. So pretzel. what what yeah 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 perfect like a pretzel. What what <laughs> got you first into the comp style benching? Who kind of uh taught you? Did you teach yourself? And how did that process kind of get refined? Because I feel like that arch in and of itself is like an art form. So in terms of my uh, mobility with my spine and everything else, I've always been really mobile. So I can touch my to toes. I can put my hand flat on the floor whenever I'm trying to reach down. Um, so naturally, I've always been able to get into that position. I didn't start doing it until maybe when I was 18 when I found out about powerlifting. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I gave it a go and it automatically felt good. I think my first uh, my first comp in the IPF or P Powerlifting Australia, I did 126 um, in the sub junior, so under 18 kilos, uh, in the under 93 kilo class. And then I stopped powerlifting for a year uh, straight up, uh, finished school, did the whole partying phase, and then got back into powerlifting. Uh, that's when I hit 155. So 155 was my first GPC comp. Uh, and then 11 weeks later, I somehow hit 180. <laughs> Love that. Just somehow out of the blue, I just pulled out, pulled out of the bag and, and, and nailed it. So was that kind of, was that the first time where you kind of almost slapped yourself to be like, okay, Obviously, I'm pretty fucking good at this and I can add some decent weight on in pretty pretty short space of time. Like for 12 weeks is not a long period of time to be putting that much weight on the bar. So how did your progression go from that? Obviously, like you're, we're up to a point now where you're pressing over 200, things are looking clean, things are looking strong. So how did you kind of get from that 180 up to kind of where you are now? Because for a lot of people from the outside kind of like, hopping from 180 up to 200 or maybe 210, 220, doesn't seem like that much. But when you got 180 kilos on the bar, put another 20 kilos on the bar, feels heavy. <laughs> so I got 180, I think back in 2014. And then I did a, I did nine weeks of Shiko and I went from 180 to 200 in nine weeks. Um, that was my first, that was my first 180 to 200. And then it kind of stored for, it took me another year to get another 10 kilos off my old, uh, my previous coach at the time. Wow. And then once I joined Sebastian, um, my bench went from around that 210 mark to 227.5 in a year and a half. And now it's been however long, and I just hit 240 a month ago. Yeah, which is insane. Insane, bro. <laughs> there are people that really, really struggle to deadlift that and squat that. So the fact that you're best pressing that just is absolutely <laughs> absurd to me. So 
it's it's wicked. Like I really, really, really want to hop off on this point though. The fact that it took you a year to add 10 kilos onto your bench press. There are so many freaking people that are probably sat out there listening to this at whatever time that will go, oh man, yeah, like I've had this stall and like I haven't been able to get over this for for like 6, 10, 12 weeks or whatever and they start getting really down about it. Dude, not being able to go up 10 kilos in a freaking year. How the hell do you not go crazy trying to deal with that? Well, at the moment, if I got five kilos on my bench in a year, I will be very, very happy. Like, I'll be ecstatic. Right now, I'm averaging about 2.5 to five kilos a year. Which obviously is not much, but then what you have to think about for yourself is that this is not, you know, this isn't a game that you're only in for, for, for a couple of years. For, for you, you want to be doing this for as long as you possibly can. And I love that kind of whole concept of that, you know, the this isn't about just getting as maximally strong as fast as you can, but this is also about longevity. And that's why I love the kind of Baz preaches. And obviously, I know you work with Andrew Locke. He's been on the show kind of preaching. You don't have to worry about getting freakishly strong right now, but if you can stay in this game for the next five years, next 10 years, next 15 years, and, you're, and you only make that 2.5, well, dude, like, over the space of 10 years, that's a big, big jump up on your total. So for all these people that are looking to kind of get that extra little bit in there, it's like, okay, you're just going to need to suck it up because once you kind of, you've made that exponential pro progress, the margins are so freaking small at that back end, man. Like, 2.5 kilos in a year, that's, that's crazy. Well... The big difference between me when I first started, so I used to make uh, big jumps just because, you know, you, you're starting out, you're still learning a lot of the techniques, so you're getting a lot stronger. So I was like, okay, this year I put on 50 kilos on my total. Next year I'll put another 50. Let's see where I am in, where I am in like five, five years, maybe 250. And it definitely didn't happen like that. <laughs> So right now, instead of thinking of a yearly goal, <laughs> I actually have a 10-year goal. And that's yeah. to be uh, hopefully 1,000 kilos by the time I'm 35. So that's just your overall total, yeah? Yeah, so I gym lifts-wise, um, I think... I totaled eight, eight eighty or eight ninety, but that's all gym lifts. That's all gym lifts. Okay. And obviously, I couldn't produce uh, nine hundred at comp because there was no comp. But let's assume nine hundred and over ten years, ten kilos on all three lifts. So all three lifts together, ten kilos over ten years, that would be around a thousand. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, that's awesome. I love that. Like seriously kind of breaking down the minutiae of like every single increment and every single lift. Like, but th that that's brilliant. How, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here. How much do you think that that game plan is going to pan out? And how much do you think that you will be able to keep those incremental gains on each of the lifts? Obviously with something like bench press, something that you're, that you enjoy more do you think that there's maybe a chance that you're going to be able to take that further and then not have to worry quite so much about the 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 deadlift and the squat obviously everyone is going to progress slightly differently with slightly different lifts and everyone obviously enjoys different things and you tend to do more of the stuff that you enjoy um i'm so with my bench press as much as i love it I am. I have accepted that it's not going to go up that much. So I think two years for me, um, I tore my patella tendon. So I couldn't really squat that well for the whole year. Um, so I squatted 300 kilos with, I think it was about six weeks of squat prep. Uh, squatted 300 and that was a PB. And then the, uh, this year... I squatted 330 in training. So for me, my squat and my deadlift have so much more potential than my uh, 
my no my squat and deadlift has so much more potential than my bench because I'm at a point where I can't really make big improvements on my bench technical uh, technique wise, but I can in my deadlift. So how much work have you done kind of since working with Baz and going over to, to, to base gym? How much has he kind of had an influence on putting more work into the squat and the deadlift? Obviously, I know he's someone that is a huge proponent of working through all three movements on a, on a very regular basis through lots of rotations of, of exercises that, that work that same movement pattern, you know, whether it's high bar, low bar, just actually doing the movement. So how has that been kind of getting in with him and, and what has he done with you that have, has kind of maybe changed things up for what you were doing previously? So a lot more focus on technique, a lot more focus on recovering and just smarter training. And like they've said, lasting longer in this sport. You're not going to last long if you've torn something off the bone. Uh, you know, it's all about longevity. And you can't do that if you're going balls to the wall every session. In terms of my lifting, in terms of my lifting, he's put... Uh, so, so far in the last, I think, two and a half years, he's put 60 kilos onto my squat. Uh, for my deadlift, he's put about 40 kilos. Uh, so, it went from 280 to 320 for two in two and a half years. And he's also put in two, uh, two and a half years around 20, 30 kilos onto my bench. Jesus, so it's a nice, what's that, like 130? He brought up your total by 130 in the space of two and a half years. That's absolutely mad. That's crazy. So, and, and you feel, do you feel like it was uh, that kind of unlocking those extra kilos was just you hammering that technique and making sure that kind of everything was ready, your setup was better, your posture was better. Was this you just kind of working slightly different accessories, building up other areas of your body? Or is, is this really just kind of at the foundation, just you getting your technique crystal clean? All about technique. Um, literally, all we had to focus on was technique. Um, took the ego out the door as well. I actually dropped back to like 50% of my lifting weight and it was just hammering, hammering over and over and over again until it's gotten to a point where I'm lifting a lot more efficiently and the numbers show. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really interesting that, you know, for, I think for a lot of people, they would probably even at kind of at the point that you're at there kind of look to you and go, okay, well, you know, this is a guy that's pulling big numbers. Like he's, he's set some records. He's strong as fuck. So to see you stripping back the weight to that extreme and going, okay, actually, no, I need to hammer this. I think is a big wake up call for a lot of people out there that, you know, are, that are in that similar position where I say, okay, I stalled on these lifts. Like something needs to, needs to be changed. I've tried, you know, I'm hitting small up, I'm hitting all these different training protocols and nothing seems to be peaking my strength. Like, what is it? It's like, okay, bro, maybe you're just not 100% on the board with your techers. Like, maybe you just need to strip it back a little bit and maybe you're just not as fucking good as you think you are. So I love that, that, that kind of like that humble nature <laughs> of like, okay, let's take things back. Let's get really, really, really good at the foundation. And then obviously when your foundation's bigger and better and stronger, you're going to build a bigger and better, stronger building on top of it. Do you know what I mean? So whenever I'm in a room with um, Sebastian or Andrew Locke or any one, uh, one of those professionals, I'll always have a completely open mind and I'll think like a beginner. So whatever I know, whatever I think I know, I'll just leave it at the door and I'm open to all ideas. I think that's brilliant. Being a sponge when you're around so many, so many guys like that, I think has such a huge benefit because... You know, I, you're incredibly blessed in the position that you're in that you can be a, a, around those guys that have such, well, one, such passion for the sport, but two, that they bring in so many different kind of thought processes in regard to 
just basically different ways of flogging the same dead horse. Like there are so many ways that you can kind of get to that end result, but these guys have been in the industry, they've seen so much and they've worked with so much that actually they they have these different thought processes and patterns that to, to most people you wouldn't even kind of contemplate. You would never even stumble upon it, but for, for them just kind of saying a particular cue or thinking about you working and stimulating this muscle more during a lift, for someone like yourself, it like completely changes the movement and that's like mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. So so um working with them as well and focus Oh no go. So how in terms of like your introduction, like working with, with Andrew, working with Seb, were there any kind of straight up key elements that, that changed in terms of like uh prehab or rehab or like things that you were doing for yourself in the gym you know whether it's kind of like activation getting ready was there anything that kind of like you came in and they were like what the fuck is that you need to stop doing that now you're you're onto this <laughs> um i still get that sometimes <laughs> right now um <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I do have my moments um, and they're just like, what the hell? <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so with uh, work, working with um, working with Andrew Locke, obviously there, are, there have been a few um, kind of like injuries, niggles and stuff that you've been working around, obviously as a, a bench specialist someone that's going to be working with that load, someone that's going to be hammering that movement that obviously brings in a whole slew of different issues that we can have in terms of like shoulder problems, spinal problems, obviously with, with, with your competition um, bench press. I know you've struggled previously with like cramping and stuff like that. So what things have you kind of chucked up into the mix to kind of maybe take the load out of your body that, that, that you don't need or kind of help your body redirect uh, kind of your attention, your focus better coming into your training. Um, nowadays, I focus a lot on prehab. I'll spend about 30 to 45 minutes before I start even working out. And I like to just take my time. I used to rush into a lot of things. I want to get straight into it. But now, yeah, a lot more attention to prehab uh, since uh, with Andrew and all of that. Yeah, and I think... It's, it's kind of, it just keeps on going back to that same kind of mantra of, you know, do, it's, it's kind of like eat that frog, do that stuff that we know no powerlifter wants to walk into the gym, look at, at that lovely shiny Alico bar and these plates or whatever it is and go, actually, you know what? Give me 30 minutes. I'll be over there in a second. I just got to go, <laughs> go, go and do this activation stuff. No powerlifter wants to do that. <laughs> But I think it, it kind of, it speaks in volume so much that if you do override that kind of, that bro mentality of like, oh, I just want to get in there and lift, man. Like, I just need to pick something heavy up. And you can push that to the, to the back of your mind. Like you said, kind of leave that ego at the door and do that stuff that kind of, you don't necessarily want to do that much of that actually you have to think about it that doing all that stuff that you don't want to do actually allows you to do more of the stuff that you do want to do, which is why I think everyone gets caught up on. Everyone's like so focused on, oh man, I don't want to warm up. I just want to bench. So you're like, but you don't understand, bro. Like you're not going to be able to do as much. <laughs> I think it's a lot more important. I think it's important for everyone, especially beginners. Like you can argue that, okay, Beginners aren't lifting heavy enough for them to be, uh, so they're not going to get injured as, uh, or they're not likely going to be injured. But at the same time, like as a beginner, you need to teach your body how to activate all these um, muscles before you start, anyways. Otherwise, you're not going to move correctly. Yeah, and then you're just putting yourself in that precarious situation where it's like, okay, you just need, you know, uh, some stimulus in the gym to not be quite on point or your brain goes for a wander at, at, at the wrong point and you could be, you, you know, you could be doing some serious, serious damage, especially with the weights that, you know, you guys are lifting. So I think that's, it's very important that people start thinking about, you know, their squat bench, their deadlift, everything is, it's whole body, man. Like, 
as much as people think, you know, bench press, it's that bro lift, you just get to lie down, it's chilled out, it's all about them titty gains, it's like, no, if you want the best out of any lift, man, you're going to have to try and capitalize on every single square inch of retail that you have on this body, because the more you can put in, the more you're going to get out. Yeah, 100%. So I'm uh, I, I'm interested to, to round this off, and I do it the same same way with everyone. It's the same question. I want you for a second to imagine that you are stepping into a time machine. You're going back in time, and you get to spend a few moments with your younger self. You're 10, 11, 12 years of age. You know, you've got your whole life ahead of you. You've got a lot of big decisions and a lot of shit that's going to eventually come your way as well. That you know, it's just part of the parcel of life. What? Uh, advice do you give to your younger self you know a mantra to live by uh, a, an, an ethic what do you say to your younger self to help you get through all of the stuff that you've had to go through in your life to get to where you are now knowing what you know uh probably to chill out a bit more um you know don't be so anxious uh take your time like you have your whole life ahead of you uh it, I, I even have to remind myself now because I'm 25 years old and Sebastian reminds me all the time, you're still so young. Like you don't need to rush everything. Uh, take your time, chill out, enjoy, enjoy your life, enjoy your life. Yeah, I absolutely love that, man. Thank you so much for coming on board and doing this. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm super, super, super stoked to see you get back into competition. I want to see that big ass bench press. I'm excited for it. I know the whole world is. Um, so, so yeah, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have you on board again at some other point. And eventually at some point, we'll eventually go over to Australia and hopefully I'll come and see all you beautiful people anyways. So uh, so thank you very much for doing this, man. I hope you have an awesome day and we, uh, we look forward to having you back on again soon. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>